welcome everybody. This is Valentine's Day. You don't have to celebrate it. What better way to think about treating your heart than focusing on your sleep? Think about it. A big connection there. You're going to learn more. Um, I, uh, you actually probably met Dr. David Chang through our previous videos on file many moons ago, actually about 55 lectures ago. He was one of our speakers and gave a great talk. He's backed by popular demand. Some of this information you may have seen, but this is really so pertinent, so I'm glad you're here tonight. Um, in fact, I was really tickled pink to, not that I read this, but I had a little heads up, that he's um, interviewed in the Costco Connections magazine. <laughs> and the topic, and, and I hope I didn't break your thunder, is, is it okay for your pets to sleep in bed with you? Oh, oh. interesting. Oh. <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> experts and it's really nice to, you know, there's so many things that affect our sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that um, this is a great topic for tonight. I'm going to switch over, let them set up, and enjoy. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Von Rohn, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I love what I do as a sleep physician. I'm passionate about what I do, and I see some familiar faces in the audience. I'm going to talk about something that we don't necessarily think about on a regular basis. I like to quote the late Rodney Dangerfield, where sleep doesn't get much respect in our society, if you think about it. It's almost as an afterthought. And through this talk this evening, I hope to make it something that's more in the forefront of what you think on any given day. My first slide here is kind of the essence of the talk. Sleep is free energy without associated calories. Now let that settle in for a minute. If we want energy throughout the day, usually it's in a form of a food item or a beverage. Usually it has calories attached to it. Sleep, by design, is there to restore every single cell in your body with no calories. Hmm. My hope this evening is to talk about what sleep is very basically, to talk about quantity of sleep to also talk about how sleep may affect your appetite. And finally, to talk about quality of sleep. I hope to get through the presentation within 25 to 30 minutes and have plenty of time for questions and answers. The first slide I have, I'm going to see if I can use the pointer here, is talking about stages of sleep. So this would be where you go to bed, and this would be hours of sleep going out here, and this would be in the morning. So when we go off to sleep, we're awake, and then we go into stage one, two, and then we go into deep sleep. A few years ago, stage three and four sleep was combined to the stage three, so, so this is an older slide. So stage three and four is only stage three depicted now in sleep studies. You can tell very quickly we spend a good chunk of that first night of sleep in deep sleep. All of us do it. So tonight when we all go off to sleep, the first stage of sleep we're going to go into is deep sleep. Sleep cycles through every 90 minutes. So imagine that. Every 90 minutes, you and I are cycling through all the stages of sleep throughout the night. Again, deep sleep, first part of the night. You can look up here, and this is REM sleep. So this is the yellow. And interesting, as the night progresses, you can see the yellow getting longer and longer. So as we sleep throughout the night, we tend to have more REM sleep in the early morning hours. And this is for all of us. You can imagine if you're de depleting yourself of sleep out here, such as getting only maybe seven or six hours of sleep, you're missing almost a whole cycle of sleep, which could have consequences. This is EEG tracing of someone's brain. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because I find it quite fascinating that when we're awake, this is what our brain waves look like. <laughs> this is when we're dreaming. This is deep sleep. So you can imagine the brain goes into different functions as we're sleeping. And we know that these are important for the brain to function properly and for our body to heal. 
And I find it just interesting that I was just studying for my board exam and that, you know, the brain and sleep is such a fascinating thing that we all do, but yet we are completely oblivious to it on any given night. This is a map of the world, probably at night. And look at all the light. Africa, Europe, America, and Asia, quite bright. This slide, 1950. This is what we predicted in 2025. The amount of light that we are exposed to in modern society has far exceeded our evolutionary development. Think about this for a second. If we sat here 100 years ago, the amount of light we would have had in this room would be probably 10 watts, maybe, one light bulb, maybe a candle, kerosene. And yet, in this society, we are exposed to so much light at night. Hmm, I wonder how that's going to affect our sleep. How many of you recognize these two slides? <laughs> I do. Yeah. I remember growing up in New Jersey, right? The television station came out of Philadelphia. And the seven stations I had, I remember around after around 11-ish, six of the seven stations would play the national anthem, right? And then one of these, I think it went to this, oh, sorry, it went to, whoa, what did I do? It went to this first and then went to this, or vice versa. <laughs> now, we turn on the TV, a thousand stations, 24-7. So talking about quantity of sleep, there's a lot of factors that affect it negative, meaning affecting our ability to get enough sleep at night. Work schedules, shift work schedules specifically for those who travel internationally. I have a lot of uh, tech workers who have teams in Asia and Europe, so they're getting up really, really early to get that conference call in, or staying really, really late to get the other end of the spectrum. The National Sleep Foundation did a study a few years ago about commuting times. The commuting times in this country has gradually increased, especially in Seattle, as you all know, and that has a direct correlation to decreased hours of sleep. Think about it. When you go to work, fix hours. Make the lunch for the kids, get ready for work. That's all fixed times in your day. The only time you can make up for the increased commuting time is get less sleep. Huge problem in our society. And as I just alluded to earlier, the electronics. So light from the TV and computer, bless you, and the computer screens will suppress melatonin secretion. So I have a lot of tech people come in and say, Doc, I can't sleep. First question I ask them is, how many computer screens do you have? The, the most I have is four, and all four were 27 inches. <laughs> I don't know why he's not sleeping well. <laughs> so light from the computer screen or TV will suppress melatonin secretion. I'm happy to say that I gave a little uh, presentation in front of the Seattle School Board a few years ago talking about the importance of later school start times for high school students. Why? Because high school students prefer to go to bed late and they prefer to get up late. So most high school students who start at 7 or 7.30 for start first school period are asleep in the first two periods. And I'm glad that they switched the school start times for high school students, and they're awake in their first period. And there's been clear research to show that people or students who get up late and go to school late actually do better. Less depression, better academic performance. And I'm glad that the Seattle School Board uh, decided to adopt that. Jet lag, obviously a problem, right? Um, especially when you travel east. So from here to Europe tends to be worse than if you're traveling west. Social debt lag got coined a few years ago, and really it's just us being up too late, right? Watching movies or reading that spy novel, and that can actually has consequences, especially on weekends. So most of us tend to get up late on weekends, and then on Sunday night it's hard to fall asleep in time for Monday morning. So what are some of the consequences of not getting enough sleep? Mood, right? People can get anxious or depressed or irritable. And some people tie those emotional states to food intake. I know Dr. Bonner and her team are working diligently with all of you to improve your lifestyles, but sometimes when you're not getting the right sleep quantity, it has other consequences to our overall well-being 
which then translates into challenges getting the weight down. Cognitive function. So if you're not sleeping enough, affects your ability to retain memory, short term and long term. Um, there's actually a study that was done with motor function. So they had a blank screen that would pop up a little light, and their goal was to hit a button when you saw the light. And they've done a bunch of research that if you're sleep deprived, your reaction time gets slower and slower and slower. And a lot of people think, oh, gosh, it's just my stage of my life. I'm a little bit older. I'm a little bit slower. Maybe not. Maybe it's just you're not getting enough sleep. Memory, as I alluded to, a lot of people say, oh, I forgot his name or her name. I forgot that telephone number. But maybe it's just that you're not getting enough sleep. Some people may watch a TV program and they, what, what did I just miss? Or they're having a conversation with a good friend over the phone and like they missed the last three or four seconds of the conversation. They're a little bit embarrassed. Maybe you had a micro sleep. Reduced learning. So I have a lot of patients who are acquiring a lot of new knowledge at work, let's say. They have to go to class and they're having troubles retaining that new information. Frustrating. Scary. Also hard to complete tasks. So I know with um, lifestyle changes, there's a lot of different changes in your routine. Well, it's hard to make those changes to begin with, but imagine if you're sleep deprived on top of that, it's hard to make that part of your new lifestyle. I like to use the battery analogy when it comes to sleep. So we all have a battery that needs to be charged. And it depends on how much we charge will likely dictate what food choices we may choose to do during the daytime. Now, it's been clear research that if you sleep deprive someone, they will eat more. They will crave sugar and carbs. Why? Well, if your battery needs to be charged fully, but it's only being charged three quarters of the day, of the morning when you wake up, you're running on a deficit. And then during the course of the day, the only way to make up for it is either you eat it or you drink it. We're not living in Europe. Right? You can't embrace a siesta. Right? So how do you do it socially acceptable in our society? Well, you have to go to the water cooler or go to the little cafeteria down, downstairs and get something. And usually you're choosing, not don't know, but most people are choosing a food item that they would normally not have chosen. But that little hit of energy, such as sugar or a carb, will perk you up to get through that meeting, but then goes to the wasteland. Vicious cycle. If you were to charge your battery fully, the choices become a lot easier in a way. You don't have that cell restart. Because you don't need that source of energy because you didn't make, you were deficit, at a deficit from the night before. You're able to achieve those goals of taking the stairs, let's say, as opposed to taking the elevator. These are two hormones that are in our bodies, leptin and ghrelin. One is made in the gut, ghrelin is, and it tells you when you're hungry. Leptin also in our body says that's when you're full. And you can go online and look at these two hormones and read about them. But very simplistically, if we are sleep deprived, for lack of a better word, the hormones get out of whack. So you will eat more than you should, and you'll be more hungry than you really are. Hmm. So there's a nice research study done a few years ago where they actually had normal, healthy young adults, and they let them sleep as much as they needed to for the first week of the study. Then they watched their caloric intake. The second week, where they sleep deprived with about half of what they normally would have gotten, their increased caloric intake went by 30 to 7, just by sleep depriving them. I find this a very fascinating study. So about in 2011, they actually looked at the Stanford basketball team. And they looked at what would happen if we allowed those students to get more sleep. Interestingly, their athletic performance improved. Their speed increased by 5%. Their free throws improved in accuracy by 9%, just by getting more sleep. Fascinating. 
The NFL, I know these days, will fly their players a few days earlier if they're traveling to the East Coast. Huh. I wonder if it has to do with their sleep and their performance. Uh, a few Super Bowls ago, uh, the, a New England Patriot fan, who I understand, pulled the alarm on the opposing team the night before the Super Bowl. <laughs> hmm. Imagine what those players went through if they got the alarm. Number one, they woke up in a startle, and it probably took them some time to fall back to sleep. Do you think it affected their performance the next day? I think so. So what have we learned so far? Adequate sleep is important for weight loss. We've identified some factors that will prevent us from getting enough sleep, and that's a huge challenge in our society. And if you're not getting adequate sleep, it can lead to hormone imbalance, resulting in cravings. So what's going to affect quality of sleep? Right? We just talked about quantity, and now we're going to talk about quality. And there's a whole host of things that affect our sleep quality as we get older. This is a very short list. Arthritis or joint pain can clearly affect us in terms of our body position. Reflux or heartburn in the middle of the night can wake us up. Parkinson's disease could lead to REM behavior disorder, fragmenting one's sleep. The challenge with Alzheimer's disease is that the circadian rhythm gets out of whack. So what ends up happening, they'll be awake in the evening or at night, they'll be asleep during the day, and then that affects the caregiver's ability to function during the day or go to work. And that usually ends up leading to placement into a nursing facility. That's a pretty well-known fact for those with uh, Alzheimer's. Menopause, lung, heart problems, and the list goes on. As a sleep physician, the biggest challenge for quality of sleep is sleep apnea. Now, I like to joke that um, no one ever comes to visit with me because they want to be there. Sometimes I wish I was a skin doctor. Or a patient would say, Doc, I got a rash. And I'm like, yeah, you do. Help me fix it. Almost every patient who comes in will be because of their partner or their doctor saying, maybe you want to get this checked out. A basic definition of sleep apnea is a shallow or pauses in the breathing that lasts from seconds to minutes. It can occur multiple times an hour. The blockage occurs in the upper airway, and I'm going to show you a cartoon in a moment of what that is. And that leads to disrupted sleep, resulting in daytime consequences. Now, unfortunately, this has not come up too clearly. So I'm going to describe to you. This is the eyes, the nose, the mouth, tongue, soft palate, throat. In this part, the patient is on his back. So the perfect storm for blocking off one's airway is when you're dreaming and on your back. Why is that? Because when you and I are sleeping, Every 90 minutes, as I showed you earlier, we're dreaming. And when you and I are dreaming, we're paralyzed. Every human being on the planet is paralyzed when they're dreaming, unless you have a neurologic disorder that prevents that from happening. So for some folks, if you're on your back, and you're dreaming, and you're paralyzed, based on your bone structure and your tongue, this could happen. The tongue falls back, hits the soft palate, and that's where the punching bag is in the back of your throat, by the way. And if you're overweight, the fat in your neck will collapse everything. Now, to be fair, the patient where this is happening to is fully asleep, and there's a blocked airway. Carbon dioxide starts rising in the bloodstream. The oxygen starts dropping. At a certain point, the brain will wake up saying, whoa, this is unacceptable for life. Wake up, wake up. And the patient will either have a grunt, snort, toss, turn, and drift right back off into sleep. The critical piece to our conversation this evening is that your brain, like mine, on any given night needs to be up for about three minutes or so in order to remember the next morning that you were up. So most people wake up remembering they went to the bathroom. 
maybe once or twice or three times, but there are going to be a whole slew of times where you may not know that you are awake. And that's why it never is an impatient coming in on their own, because they don't know that this is happening. So symptoms of snoring, of sleep apnea, as loud snoring as I discussed, choking, gasping. To be clear, not everyone who snores has sleep apnea. So probably the biggest referral will be a patient's partner saying that the patient snores. And of course, the patient's a little bit put off by the fact that they've been told that they snore. And then my job, along with the patient, is to sort out why are they snoring, and could there be something else beyond the snoring. Commonly, morning headaches, memory issues, again, mood issues if you're not sleeping well, urination at night. So a lot of patients will have nighttime nocturia or urination at night. For men, they think it's their prostate. And sometimes it's not. So I had a lot of patients from urologists where the workup for the man has been completely normal, and yet they're spitting up four to five times a night. And many times, if there is sleep apnea and we treat it, the nighttime urination goes away or improves significantly. I have a handout that I'll give you in a moment, but this is um, the stop bang questionnaire that you can fill out when you go home to see if you or someone else that you know may be at risk. It was generated by an anesthesiologist many years ago to assess patients who were going to the operating room because there was a high risk of uh, complications if you have sleep apnea um, and if you have sleep apnea, um, and coming out of anesthesia. <clears throat> Poor quality of sleep can affect the benefit of the quantity of sleep. So I have a lot of patients who get a lot of sleep and they feel exhausted. Well, for those folks, it may be because their quality of sleep is not where it needs to be. So from my perspective as a sleep physician, I always focus on quality and quantity and look at both. It's not just one for most people. So we talked about these points. So how can I improve my sleep quantity? And this is a challenge for most of my patients, I'll be honest with you. Okay? So I have this conversation about 50 times a week. Uh, I will tell you that about 10% really follow through. Okay? But because I'm passionate about what I do, I know the importance of more sleep in terms of one's health. I just tell all my patients. And I will say probably almost 100% of my patients are sleep deprived. I'd like to say jokingly that it is a badge of honor in our society to run sleep deprived. We're told from a very young age, you'll not amount to much in life if you sleep your life away. You'll fail. And somehow we really embrace those thought processes. So I say sleep is the ultimate fountain of youth. Hmm. I recommend nine hours. And the response and the look I give them. <laughs> <laughs> and the, it's very fascinating when you go on vacation and there's no set schedule to that vacation. Think back. How many hours did you default to? Hmm. A little bit more than eight, maybe eight and a half, nine. And then when you come back to Seattle, what's the first thing you do? We've been sleep deprived. It's not necessarily that sunny beach or that beautiful mountain that I felt so great. It could have been the fact that I just got more sleep. Turning off electronics two hours before bedtime is really important. Now, I know there's a lot of filters out there and a lot of blue light screens. They may work. By the time someone comes to me, though, I'm going old school, no electronics. If you want to read a book, paper, with a light source behind you. If you decide to use a Kindle, you can use the black background with the white lettering as opposed to the other way. OK, it's a little bit different. Um, maintaining the same schedule seven days a week, very, very challenging. What do you mean I can't sleep in on Saturday and Sunday? I mean, come on, Doc. I have to make up for what I'm missing during the work week. But that, again, induces social jet lag. 
So therefore, you're going to New York if you're going getting up three hours later. Sunday night, you're coming back to Seattle, trying to fall asleep in time. You're not going to be able to fall asleep. Monday morning, you're sleep deprived. Oh, gosh, it's Monday morning. But you got enough sleep the night before, it may not even be too bad on Monday morning. How do I do that? Well, I would go to bed 15, 10 minutes every two to three days, gradually, incrementally going to bed earlier. If you went to bed two hours early tonight, I guarantee you would either have insomnia for two hours or get up two hours earlier. You'd be like, that was a stupid bit of advice. So if we do it incrementally, we'll be able to achieve that. And one of the things I've suggested is setting an alarm on your cell phone at night with a different jingle. Because personally, you'll be like, what's that jingle? Why is something going off? And then you're like, oh, i got to stop whatever I'm doing now and start winding down. And once you get to that sweet number, whatever that number is for you, I would do it for about 45 days. Again, this is a tough bit of advice, but I believe if you embrace this, your work with Dr. Baumgartner and her team will be much, much more successful if you made sleep the number one priority in your life. I joke with my patients, for most of them, sleep is not even the top 1,000 things they need to achieve on any given day. Right? It's not even that list. A lot of patients will make initial success with their lifestyle changes, lose some weight, but then the weight comes back, and there's that yo-yo. I believe, personally, if you, if you make sleep a priority, you're able to maintain those sleep patterns and use your hormones to your advantage. Having your mood to your advantage, being happy and glad and sat and enjoying what you're trying to do as opposed to slogging through it. In terms of quality of sleep, I mean, you know, again, I have the questionnaire out there. I would be assessed for sleep apnea if you have it. Most people who are overweight have sleep apnea. And about a third of my patients also have. I had a young 23-year-old today who you never think would have this problem, but based on bone structure that I just showed you, she's at risk. Sleep apnea tends to run in families, too. Okay, so it's highly genetically correlated. Limit caffeine intake to um, in the morning, because the caffeine can linger in our bodies for quite some time. Also, reducing stress during the day. So if you build up a lot of stress at night, it may be hard for you to trail off and fall asleep. So if you can engage in relaxing behaviors during the day and offload some of that stress that builds up during the day, it may make sleeping a lot easier. And that's more for insomnia patients. And exercise is always important. Um, did I mention I don't promote sex appeal at the sleep center? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so no one wants to come visit with me because of the mask. Right? No one wants to wear a seat pad. Um, and so I, I didn't put in my slides, but as I'm talking, I'm like, i got to bring that up, right? Because that's the elephant in the room. Um, and so I tell my patients that I'm giving you air. Hmm. Air is kind of important for our well-being. It's pretty safe. There is a steep learning curve with wearing a mask, and I work with a great team to help people get acclimated. A lot of people have had friends and family who've had very bad experiences with the CPAP. And in my and I try to acknowledge that feeling that they've had. I've also had patients who've had traumas in their lives. Um, who wearing a mask brings them back to a very terrible place in their life in the past, uh, such as abuse, near drowning, uh, having a loved one in the intensive care unit on a breathing machine. And I'm, I'm inheriting a lot of patients who've tried and failed therapy, and when I ask those three questions, many times there's one or two or even three of those questions coming back up positive. And then I say to them, I want to acknowledge the child within who's very fearful here to being here and worried about the mask. And we work, I do work with them in a much different way than my folks who want to say, Doc, I want to do it. Okay? So that's how I work with the patients to get a really good history to find out where they're coming from. Thank you for listening. Here are some references. And I'm open for questions. Thank you.
okay, so what about the cat? There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So animals uh, have a different sleep cycle than we do. Cats, dogs, they're up in the middle of the vacation, they jump off the bed, jump on the bed, they want to snuggle, <laughs> and then that fragments your sleep. Then you may be up for 20 minutes or longer. When we get our day going, we don't have the luxury of going back to bed. Believe you me, your little furry friend is asleep. <laughs> and that's the hard part, because we want to snow. And for a lot of us, our animals are almost like our children. And I, and when I had, was asked to write that in Costco, I didn't choose the no side, believe it or not. And I actually waited almost 48 hours to accept that opportunity, because I was so I'm uneasy about writing no to pets and that because people have a really strong emotion to their animals. But I always want to be in Costco Connection, so that one out. So, um, uh, so that's the reason why I personally don't necessarily want pets in bed. But at the same time, you have a king side bed and you have a three pound cat, it's on the end of the bed, fine. It's usually the folks with two or three golden retrievers. <laughs> <laughs> you have a 55 pound on its win. So I, I personally, my, my, my physician assistant, Margaret Duffy, does a lot of wonderful work with insomnia patients. And she actually raises and brings up those questions with the patients who have challenges. I feel that usually good judgment, but a lot of times I actually had some responses from uh, polyclinic employees just in the last day or two, he said, I never thought about my animals fragmenting my sleep. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that I wrote the article, but I, I kind of use kick gloves depending on the patient and the individual in terms of how we address that. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Cat mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm just. Well, I have a question. Um, you mentioned briefly about leptin and ghrelin, mm -hmm. and a lot of us have heard about that and, and talked a little bit about it. I, in, in, from my non-sleep specialist perspective, I still see that almost as like research. Like we don't know. We're, we're learning a lot about that. Mm -hmm. I've seen people in the community measure levels, and I'm very skeptical. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious about you know where do you think that's going, and how we learn more about that, and how it might help us clinically. Well, just like a lot of things, when we measure blood work for each of us sitting in the room, there's a range that may be normal for us or abnormal, and it's based on other baseline studies. I don't necessarily, necessarily check levels, so I would agree. I think the data is still more research-based. But it's just interesting to know that when you're sleep-deprived, how it affects our hunger hormones, right? And you can do your own experiment. Just with my recommendations, if you got more sleep and you track your caloric intake, let's say, and it started going down and you felt more energized, well, that's kind of interesting. Without changing anything else, which is always a bit hard. Um, so for me, I find it, it is a causation. And if you're not getting enough sleep, no matter the efforts that you want to do during the daytime in terms of behavioral changes, your hormones are working against you which makes achieving your goals much more harder. So at my, and from my perspective, as you work with Dr. Barnbottle and her team, let's try to make everything work in your benefit. Why not make sleep a priority? You have nothing to lose, except for that program at 10 or 11 at night, <laughs> which you could TV them, by the way, right? <laughs> so I say have as much TV and um, opportunity to, to be on electronics during the daytime Really, if you start cutting out electronics, what will happen? You'll get bored. <laughs> and then I'll get sleepy. So getting back to your question, I, I agree with you. I think it's more experimental. I, I don't think checking that, because you don't know if there's a circadian rhythm associated with it when you check it. And you can be going off on a wild goose chase uh, with something that's not really well known. That's a really good question. So how did you come 
up with nine hours, and it kind of sounds like nine hours universally for all yeah. people. So if you look at the research from um, the early 1900s, the average American got nine hours of sleep. Hmm. Have we evolved that much in 100 years to be sleep deprived on average by two hours? <coughs> I don't think so. And again, goes back to that analogy of when you're on vacation, what do you default to? Most of us get more sleep. Mm -hmm. So I shoot for nine hours because I realize people will fall short of that number. <laughs> okay, so if I tell you to get eight, what's going to happen? <laughs> seven, seven and a half. But if you shoot for nine and you realize your number is about eight hours and 23 minutes and that's your sweet spot, you'll know. But if you shoot for eight and you only get seven hours and 23, you'll never know what your true number is. So I, I tend to say shoot for nine, but most people will fall short of that. On vacation, if I may ask, on your last vacation, or do you recall like, what your body defaulted to? No, actually, I just I retired recently. Oh, so congratulations! I've been, I've been trying to figure that out. Yes. And, um, but maybe I'm taking it the opposite way, so I'm staying up and then allowing myself to sleep in in the morning. How so successful is that for you? Sleeping in. Fine. So when you used to work, what time were you getting up? Um. No, Which when you were working? To work oh, um, quarter to six. Oh. So the fact that you can sleep till nine is great. Most people, as they get older, and even you know, at my age, we tend to wake up at the same time because we tend to default to our genetic circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. So for many of us, Doc, I only get six hours because I can't sleep in no matter what time I go to bed. And I said. That's true, because as we get older, we tend to wake up at our genetically predetermined time. So it's all about going to bed earlier to get that increased hours of sleep. Yeah, and there's a feeling in me that if I'm not up by 6.30, the whole day is gone. Correct. But you got up at 9 today. Yeah. Great. What time did you go to bed last night, if I may ask? Probably. Um, the spine novel kept me up until about 12.30. So it's very really fascinating, right? Just in that little example, you got about eight and a half hours. Which, again, is probably what your body needs on a regular basis. So yeah, enjoy your retirement and have one with that spine novel. Uh, yes? I, you know, I'm sure it would be extremely difficult to study light pollution but I keep going back to those maps you showed mm -hmm. of the amounts of light. And I know even in my lifetime, uh, Seattle is bright. And is anybody, I, I don't even know how somebody could study that. But do you know, are people trying to? Yeah. I would just anecdotally look at the TV screens Oh, yeah, cell huge. phones, yeah. the, I mean, the computer screens. I mean, I remember the 27-inch TV was, you know, on the other side of the living room growing up, and I had to go up and turn the channel, <laughs> right? Um, and now you have three or four of them, not more than three feet from your eyeballs. So I think just inherent to our society, light is a problem for our own biorhythm. So. There's a, there's a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that is the timekeeper for all of us sitting in the room. And there's a direct link from our eyeball to that timekeeper as it relates to light. Light helps determine when you should be sleepy or awake. So in, in, our, in Seattle, this time of year, most of us do not have our lights on during the daytime. Right? I'm getting some light through the window. Hmm, wonder why I'm sleepy and tired. Well, if your brain isn't getting enough light during the day, it cannot wake up. Then at night, when you turn on the TV, there's a blast of light. Gosh, I'm all of a sudden energized. I don't want to go to sleep. Because you almost trick your brain 
the thinking that it's morning in the evening because you turn on the light and now your brain is waking up. So I give a lot of my patients a very simple recommendation and I'll tell you it's not being green and not being energy efficient. Get broad spectrum light bulbs for your room that you're sitting in. And I'll tell you, it's a bit harder to get these because of the change in the rules and lighting nurses in the country. So go to Lowe's or Home Depot and just ask the lighting expert if you want broad spectrum, not these, these are fluorescent, but broad spectrum and increase the amount of light in the room that you're sitting in during the daytime to as bright as a sunny day here in Seattle at noon time. So imagine how much light that is in the summertime at noon. And I tell my patients to expose themselves during the day and then cut out the electronics at night. And I've had some wonderful experiences. People come back, Doc, that, that, I mean, I feel great now. The only worry is if you have bipolar, a lot of bright light could tr trigger a manic episode. That's the only caveat with bright light and bipolar. Um, but that would be one recommendation. I don't know if I answered your question, but that, yeah, that's, that's a very, very simple, especially in Seattle. Um, and folks who are retired, who aren't in, out, out and about, they're in their indoors a lot more. I've had some wonderful responses just by exposing the amount of light they're getting uh, from day to night. Yeah. So one of my um, challenges I've had for uh, a long time is I get up at 5.15. Mm -hmm. So I try and kind of start bedtime at around 9.30 and read and so forth. and. Cat's not a problem. Trainer never comes to the bedroom. It's the family. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a teenager who's 17. Earliest bedtime would be midnight. Yeah. And the husband who's retired. Oh my goodness. And he's a night owl. So I think a lot of people, everyone has their story, but a lot of us, we may know what we want to do, but actually doing it is really hard. And I've had to be selfish, like almost nasty, at 9.30, I am not talking about taxes. I am not talking about <laughs> finances or even good things like a vacation. I am trying to turn my brain off, and I'm met with some resistance. And uh, I said, why don't wake you at 5.15 and talk about taxes? So, you know, it's, it's really interesting to have to really work on it. And I think everyone is working on it. It's, it's a challenge. And it's interesting you say that because a lot of times the patient in my practice is the one who's trying to compromise to the partner who has a completely different circadian rhythm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to your analogy, uh, it's, a, it's a silly analogy, so bear with me, is that back in the Neanderthal days, your husband's ancestor was the one that guarded the tribe till about midnight. Your ancestor back then was the one that got up early to get the breakfast going. Okay, and you've inherited that gene sequence over the millennia to where we are now, where there's a dichotomy. Because he gets probably gets more energized by seven, eight, nine. Eleven. And you're like, <laughs> what's going on? Uh, and so when people have such dramatic circadian rhythm, usually one is compromising and suffering in a way. I mean, you're doing a really good job by saying no, yeah. 9.30. But even then, I'm guessing about 8 or 8.30, you're already ready to wind down, maybe. But because of you know the rest of the family. And your daughter probably inherited his gene sequence. But, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, when no, it comes no. to that. <laughs> um, so it, it's fascinating when yeah. you start, even in the family. Yeah. Yes. I got lots of questions. By the way. First one is the, the line item about the exercise and doing that in the morning or mm -hmm. early evening. Is there, in your mind, a way of uh, uh, a span of a certain amount of hours between finishing that physical activity and trying to go to sleep? Or yeah. what, what, what kind of time you ever So I'm about? not a physiology expert, but one of the benefits of exercising is the endorphin hit we get, right? Mm -hmm. The feel good feeling. Mm -hmm. And that can last for a long period of time. More recently, there's been research suggesting it's okay to exercise right before bedtime if it doesn't bother you, right? Because it's so hard for us to engage in exercise in our society, and some of us, that is only when we have time. But because of the endorphins and you're feeling good, it's hard to wind down as a result of feeling good. So that would be the reason why you want some period of time before your last 
push up and before you go to bed. And you probably know your body well enough to know, okay, I can't do it right before, but maybe two hours, I'm okay, and I'm able to fall asleep. Okay, so it's gonna be kind of a... Dependent on, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what about eating before going to bed? You, <clears throat> over the years, you've heard, I've heard things, read yeah. things, don't eat this, don't eat four hours before you try to well, <laughs> so, reflux can be an issue of being too close to bedtime. Uh, so, if you eat close, depending on what food I know, we can regurgitate. Um, I, I'll defer to Dr. Bongo and her team. Clearly, they have more understanding of food and whatnot. But obviously, we want a certain amount of time before your last meal. Could that snack late in the evening? Could that be your body telling you you're ready to go to bed and needs a source of energy? So therefore, as you're watching TV and they're advertising all these wonderful food products, I want to go and grab some and eat it? Huh. So a lot of patients who have a need to have a little snack at night, I say, why not just go to bed? Because maybe your brain goes, no, I want to stay up and read the spine now but your body's already exhausted and it can't function anymore and then it rationalizes off why it deserves a little treat or a little snack. Uh, so in my experience with people telling me, I said, maybe your body's just tired and it's time to go to bed. We talk a lot about what's called surfing the urge, you know, you feel like you want something but is that really what you want and, mm -hmm. and just, like you say, maybe it's just like for something else. I knew that some people who are or um, diabetic really do need a bedtime snack, but that's a little bit, that's more like a medical thing, so. Yeah. yeah. And if you're watching TV or surfing the net, there's always those ads for foods that you know you shouldn't be eating, too. And it's just interesting how it all kind of dovetails together. I'm still going. So. No, it's, these are really good questions. I, I get the impression I don't think too much about blue blockers. I, I, I seem to have pretty good luck with my blue blocker glasses. Yeah. But I'm just wondering if maybe that's more up here than reality. Or... Um, so I usually say this to my patients who come visit with me. By the time you're visiting with me, I'm going old school. If you're not visiting with me, it's probably working for you, okay. if that helps. I mean, you know, not everyone needs, if the blue blockers are working, that's fine. It also can be the content that you're engaging in that can be more stimulating than not. So there could be a lot of variables why people have challenges with electronics. Yeah. One more question. No, this, I think you're asking, you're asking for a lot of other people in the room, so. Um, personally, I have a real problem anytime I go through a time change. Yes. Um, traveling east, west, doesn't matter. It's been an hour. Mm -hmm. um, switching on and off to daylight savings. Yes. So, um, and, and literally, it takes me a good week. Mm -hmm. um, I'm suffering right now. I yeah. just got back from the trip. Is there any tricks or any suggestions you have for maybe cutting that that transition time? So, where did you just come back from, from Hawaii. Hawaii. Okay. Two hours. So, so you're not getting too much sympathy from the rest <laughs> of the world. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So one thing you could do, and these are some are more practical than others. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one thing, if you're, you know, you're flying back to Washington, you can start adjusting your schedule while you're in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it's about I think a three-hour difference. Two. 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 Right now it's two. I don't know. If they okay. Because, two of, because I don't think they change their time. No, really I don't. Know. So, two right now. Two. So you could start. You know, um, so right now it's only uh, 4.30 their time, right? So you could start going to bed earlier when you're coming back. That's not really fun, right? Because yeah. you want to enjoy the sun. And, very difficult. Yeah, very difficult. <laughs> uh, if you're traveling across multiple time zones, which you were, I would avoid alcohol in the flight, which is hard, especially if you're traveling internationally, because you get as much wine as you want internationally, uh, and it's free, and it's like whatever, but you really want to avoid alcohol. Okay. Um, some folks may get a sleep aid to kind of adjust in flight, where they're, when they get on the plane, they're trying to adjust immediately to their destination time. And that can be a challenge depending on what time you're leaving here and where you're ultimately going. 
Uh, I know the new Boeing planes have the light that changes as you're flying across the, the, the ocean or the continent to help change your circadian rhythm. I think is helpful. Um, arriving and trying to adjust to local time is the key. And, and light is really the most powerful way of help setting your circadian rhythm. Okay. okay. And we talked about light during this talk. So to our advantage, if you're flying and you get to Europe, you want to maintain and adjust your light to the local time and get as much bright light upon or out, depending on what time you're riding in the morning, get as much bright light to kind of wake yourself up and hopefully you'll catch a second wind, maybe taking a little nap in the afternoon, right, because you're going to be really jet lagged, but not too much, long of a nap, and then quickly try to get into the local time. Really, the challenging uh, patients are the ones who have to do it for work. Okay, so imagine you're here in Seattle. You gotta go to New York. You work for Wall Street, one of the big firms there, or you work for Amazon, you're going to the East Coast. They have a 7 a.m. meeting on the East Coast. That's 4 a.m. in Seattle, which means they're getting up at 3 a.m. in order to get ready to be at the meeting for New York. Those are the folks that really suffer. Okay? And those are the ones who end up gaining a lot of weight because they're completely sleep deprived, their ghrelin and leptin levels are out of sync, they have to stay awake. You can't fall asleep at the big power meeting, and what do they do? They eat. So that's a double whammy for those who have to travel for it. For those who are on pleasure, you get to take that little nap, right, when you're sleeping, and just take it, restore yourself for a little bit, and then get on to the local time. It, they say it takes one day for every hour difference. I think it's longer as we get older. Okay, you just said, right, you're weak, you're weak. Even though it's a two hour difference, it took you about, I'm not surprised. If you think about it as humans, we were never designed to move across time zones as we are in modern society. A hundred years ago, traveling to New York, take you a while. <laughs> right? so, travel to Hawaii, wouldn't be a few hours. So this is a consequence of modern society. We enjoy it, we have the luxury of it, but there is a consequence. And, and sleep is a byproduct of that, unfortunately. Great questions. I love it. Yes. Uh, let's, go, let's go to these no, two and then we'll go back to you. That's okay. Yes. Um, can side sleepers ever get sleep apnea? I mean, you don't get it from sleeping on your side, but do you, side, you find some slide, side sleepers say, oh, but I sleep on my that side. Is, sleep apnea, apnea? That is a great question. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, you just opened up Pandora's box for me. Okay. <laughs> um, which is fine. I wasn't going to go down this, but you said you brought it up. Uh, we get the bonus, right? This is Valentine's and Ash Wednesday. The folks who prefer to sleep on their stomach or on their side, not on their back, may actually have sleep apnea. Well, because, and that's why they do it. Correct. So a lot of my patients, when I examine them, I make this statement. I don't think you were a back sleeper very much when you were younger. Oh. They go, yeah, Doc, how did you know that? <laughs> or they burst into tears. <laughs> right. and, and then I get started explaining to them, and usually as we get older, the shoulders, the hips, the neck, the back go, uh-uh, you're not sleeping on your stomach anymore. Usually that's in your late teens and 20s. And then you become a side, side, stomach. But then in your 30s and 40s, the shoulder, the hip go, uh-uh. And now you're spending more time on your back. And then the partner goes, you're snoring a lot more. You're annoying me. You're stopping breathing. You're getting hit, right? The partner's hitting the patient. <laughs> and then the patient comes into my office. <laughs> <laughs> so, very fascinating, people with sleep apnea from childhood will know that being on their back is something uncomfortable or disconcerting, and they avoid it, and they're able to. But as the body gets a little bit more creaky and a little bit more stiff, now they're spending much more time on their back, and that's when they come to see me. They injured their shoulder three months ago. Now all of a sudden the partner is saying you snore a whole bunch. Or they had surgery, breast surgery because of cancer, and now they're on their back a lot more. That, I mean, that is a very great question that no one ever asks. 
But that is a very subtle point that pause, pulses ultimately the patient to come to visit because their body will not allow them to be on their side. That's almost every single patient that I see who would have come on their own is that their body causes them to be on their back. It's the most comfortable position now, and they're being told that things are happening at night. Does, does anyone have any questions? Well, that's a really subtle point. I'm not sure if I explained it clearly or not. Um, it's a fascinating part of my history that I tease out from the patient. Because that's because most of what never thinks about body position. Right? I sleep when I sleep, and who cares? Who knows? But that subtle point is very key to me talking to the patient and kind of teasing out why are they here today versus three months from now or six years from ago. It's usually the body changing. Uh, yes? Two hour nap in the afternoon and five, four hours of nighttime sleep. Is that what you're doing? No, but right. if it were hypothetical. <laughs> asking for a friend. Asking with, for a with friend. With or without asking a friend. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah. I would say that in a 24 hour period, we need about eight to nine hours. Some of us, and I just had a patient this week who physically cannot sleep more than six hours because of arthritis. So he takes another two hour nap because he's able to kind of get to the six hours, the body goes, we're done, and then makes it up later in the day. As human brains, we have evolved to be asleep in one chunk. Babies, Smaller animals will sleep, be up, sleep, be up, sleep, be up, right? That's normal. But if you look at the evolution and development of human brains, we have developed into one chunk of sleep. Unless you're sleep deprived at night, which then requires you to make up those hours later in the day. Or due to other medical issues, right? There's a whole bunch, bunch of medical issues that I talked about that can affect quality and quantity, and those can affect your ability to get it all in one chunk as we get older or even if you're younger with other medical issues. Can I answer your question? Well, so if someone willingly wanted to make that a habit, would that be something that you would not recommend? It depends on the context, like I said. I, I have a lot of people who purposely do it because that's what they choose to do. Mm -hmm. So one would be, let's say your husband likes to stay up late but then has to take the children off to school. So they'll get up early, do their chores, and then once everyone's out of the door, they'll go back and sleep for another two hours, let's say, right? They couldn't get it all in one chunk. Um, it depends on the individual. Yeah. I would say for most of us who are healthy, one chunk of sleep at night. What kind of sleep is that now? Someone does get the, the siesta. Yes. Uh, you know, most of us will say, okay, 20 minutes is good, Doc, but if I get two hours, I feel like I, I'm drunk, or I, I, I feel like this weird feeling. And so a lot of times if you get into those hour plus, you went into deep sleep, and then when you wake up out of that deep sleep, you're kind of in the drunken state, that terrible feeling that we all experience on occasion when we take a nap. So we recommend about, if you are taking a nap, let's say you're on a trip and you're flying back, you need 20 minutes, 30 minutes, that way it gets you into that lighter stage of sleep and you don't get into that deep sleep. The, I, whether it should be considered a habit or not is my other question. The sleep? Yeah, whether it needs to be one chunk. Yeah, ideally, as in a human adult. I mean, babies, they're sleeping and wait, because that's just the way the brain is developed. Any other questions? These are great questions, Dr. Baumgartel. Did you prime them for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I, have, I have one. Yes, please. So I got evaluated and, and was determined that I sleep apnea. Okay. But I'm, I have problems sleeping through the whole night with the sleep mask on. I still wake up. Mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. Is that pretty common? I don't So I'm going to ask you some, uh, I'm going to get into the weeds with you, if that's okay. Sure. Do you have a nasal pillow, nasal mask, or a full? Nasal mask. 
the nose only or mouth and nose? Mouth and mouth. Okay. Are you wearing a chin strap? Okay. So, very quickly, folks with a nasal, and I apologize for those of you who aren't wearing CPAPs, and it's getting just a, and, or nasal pillow, if you don't wear a chin strap, when we're dreaming, remember I said we're paralyzed? This could happen. And a gush of air could come out, wake you up, you close your mouth as you're waking up, and then before you know you're up, you're like, how did I wake up? Or if your head shifts at night, the mask can get a little cockeyed, gush of air into your eye, and then you're up. Mm -hmm. So from when I hear my patients tell me they wake up at night, I say, well, let's add the chin strap and then see how things go. And that usually helps resolve that issue. Okay. Or if you're not using humidification in the machine can affect things. Or if the pressure is too high. So those are all. Yeah, I thought the pressure was too high at one time, but um, they said that it needed to be high okay. for it to be effective. Um, and so it's all individualized, but that would be the other thing I would look at is maybe lowering the pressure. Yeah. Well, I'm going to step up for a moment and say once again, thank you so much. It was just a pleasure to have you here. I always learn. I always learn from these lectures. That was wonderful. So um, I wish you all a good evening. If you want to stay for the extra questions after, um, feel free to have a good drive and have a good sleep tonight. Yeah. <laughs>